Hello again, biology. This is Cynthia Coulthard again from Hamilton Middle School. I am coming to you today with a lesson about explaining sickle cell disease and sickle cell trait. A quick reminder on how to use this PowerPoint. Please remember to work at your own pace. Your health and family come first. And if you need to review this slide, go ahead and pause the video and have a quick look. So again, we are going to be talking about sickle cell disease today, which is going to help us continue our explanation of how a fatal disease can persist in a family. You just finished up a lesson with Ms. Tool about mutations, and so we're going to continue on from that lesson and include that in our explanation of sickle cell disease. After reviewing this PowerPoint, there are a number of things that you should be able to do including comparing individuals with sickle cell disease, sickle cell trait, and normal red blood cells at the organism, cellular, and molecular scale. You should be able to explain how your genotype determines your phenotype for this specific trait, and describe the inheritance of genetic traits in a family. So let's get started. So the question that we're going to be asking right now is how do we determine if a person has sickle cell disease or has sickle cell trait and is a carrier of sickle cell disease? Well, we're going to be looking at their red blood cells and your red blood cells are very important for carrying oxygen throughout your body. So if you have 100% normal red blood cells, you don't have sickle cell disease or sickle cell trait. If some of your cells, red blood cells, are sickled and some are normal, then you have sickle cell trait. And this happens in 1 in 13 African American births. Generally, people with sickle cell trait don't have symptoms. If all of your red blood cells are sickled, then you have sickle cell disease. And this happens in 1 in 365 African American births. And this disease can kill if it's not treated properly. And we watched some videos earlier about people with sickle cell disease and the treatments that they have available to them. So how is it determined if a person has sickle cell disease or trait? Well, we need to look at their red blood cells and we need to consider where the information that codes for these red or the protein in these red blood cells comes from. So a quick reminder from our back from our vocabulary lessons, homologous pairs of chromosomes all have the same genes, but they're not necessarily always identical because the alleles can be different. And remember that alleles are just different versions of the exact same gene. So here we have a chromosome from mom and a chromosome from dad. And we're looking specifically at the gene that codes for hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is a protein that's made in your body that is the specific thing that carries oxygen in red blood cells. So if you have the allele for the non-functional hemoglobin, it causes your red blood cells to sickle. If you have the allele for the functional hemoglobin, then your red blood cells don't sickle. So in this example, we have a person who has a non-functional allele from one parent and a functional allele from another parent. And a quick reminder that in our cells, both of the alleles are used. So both of the genes are turned on, meaning the proteins from both of those genes are being made. So in this cell, both non-functional and functional hemoglobin proteins are being made. So how did these two different alleles for hemoglobin come to exist? Well, a quick review of lesson 5.1 reminds us that good old mutations can change the A's, G's, C's, and T's of your DNA, leading to brand new alleles in uh, different genes. So if an individual has sickle cell disease or sickle cell trait, how do they come to have these non-functional alleles? And I want to remind you of lessons three and lessons four. Lesson three 
uh, were a number of lessons about meiosis and lesson four about making gametes about how your DNA is uh, organized and split into eggs and sperm. So you get these non-functional alleles from your parents. So we have a bit of practice here to make sure that we understand how our phenotype is determined by our genotype, going through the process of understanding what's happening with the chromosomes. So when you have normal red blood cells, that means that you are only producing the functional hemoglobin proteins, which means if we look back at the previous slide, we'll, we've drawn the functional gene as a like filled in box. So if you're only making functional hemoglobin, then both of your homologous chromosomes that contain this gene have functional genes. Well, what if you have sickle cell trait? With sickle cell trait, remember you're making both functional and non-functional hemoglobin, which means you'll have on one of your homologous chromosomes a gene that codes for functional hemoglobin, and the other will have the gene that codes for non-functional hemoglobin. Last but not least, if you have sickle cell disease, that means all of your red blood cells are sickled and your cells are only producing the non-functional hemoglobin. So both of the genes on this homologous pair are the non-functional hemoglobin. So what are your genotypes? If we think back to lesson 2.5, zooming into sickle cell with Ms. McGinty, we know that scientists often represent the alleles for sickle cells with the letters A and S, with A representing normal hemoglobin, or HBA, and S representing sickle hemoglobin, or hemoglobin that causes sickle cell disease, or HBS. So the genotype for normal red blood cells with only functional hemoglobin would be AA, or normal normal. Those with sickle cell trait, they have one gene that codes for the functional uh, hemoglobin and one gene that codes for the non-functional hemoglobin. So they would be AS. And for sickle cell disease, where only non-functional hemoglobin is being produced, the genotype would be SS. Now, this isn't the only way to represent these genotypes. Sometimes we can think of the uh, S for functional, or big S for functional, and little s for non-functional. And if you do more work in genetics, you'll often see that uh, big letters and their corresponding little letters are used to represent genotypes. So if big S is the functional gene, or the gene that codes for functional hemoglobin, then the genotype for uh, normal red blood cells would be big S, big S. The genotype for those with sickle cell trait with one gene that codes for the functional hemoglobin and one gene that codes for the non-functional hemoglobin, that would be big S, little s. And for those with sickle cell disease who are only producing the non-functional hemoglobin, the genotype for that would be little s, little s. So in order to explain inheritance across the scales, we're going to be going back to the genetics three questions, which is what's happening at the organism scale, what's happening at the cellular scale, and what's happening at the molecular scale. At the organism scale, the observable trait that we are talking about is whether a person has sickle cell disease, sickle cell trait, or neither. What's going on at the cellular scale we're talking about which proteins are being made. Is the gene coding for the functional hemoglobin protein, which makes those round red blood cells? Or is the cell producing non-functional hemoglobin, which produces those sickled red blood cells? And how does the cell know which one to produce? Well, that goes down to the molecular scale and how DNA is involved in the trait. If the DNA, the homologous chromosome, contains the gene for functional hemoglobin, it will make functional hemoglobin. 
if it contains the gene for non-functional hemoglobin, the cell will make non-functional hemoglobin. And again, a reminder that both genes in a homologous pair are used, and so both proteins are, or both types of proteins are produced. And that is what gives us these three different organism scale observable traits. Whether you have normal red blood cells and therefore no sickle cell disease or trait, whether you have sickle cell trait or sickle cell disease. So this brings us back to our driving question, which is how a fatal disease can persist in a family. You may need to submit your final model to your teacher. Uh, check with your teacher about that. But what we're asking you to do now is to fill out the model revision tool to plan for how you're going to do your final model. So you did an initial model way back at the beginning of this unit. Now you're going to use a tool to plan how you're going to add and change this model to reflect what you've learned so far. Remember that you can use pictures and written explanations to show your ideas. So you can draw chromosomes, you can write notes, you can draw arrows, whatever it does or whatever it is that helps you express and explain what you know. A quick note to make sure that you are answering all three of those genetics questions, so organism scale, cellular scale, and molecular scale, to talk about people with and without sickle cell disease. A quick check for understanding. You might want to do this with a classmate over the phone or with a family member. So see if you can compare individuals with sickle cell disease, sickle cell trait, and normal red blood cells uh, at all three scales, the organism scale, cellular scale, and the molecular scale. Can you explain how a person's genotype determines their phenotype, which is the trait of whether or not you have normal, normal red blood cells, sickle cell trait, or sickle cell disease? And see if you can use all of this information to describe how uh, the inheritance of genetic traits in a family happen. So what's coming up? You're going to be working on your model revision tool and completing your final model and check with your teacher on whether or not you will be submitting this. The next lesson after, after you've completed your final model is with Ms. Jatul where you're going to be working on explaining other examples of uh, genetics in traits or sorry, genetics in families. I hope you have a wonderful day today and I will see you in another lesson.